Okay, and it looks like we are live on YouTube. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, my name is John Lustria. It's wonderful to be with you today. Uh, I'm the education coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And we have a really excellent uh, program for you today. I think you all will enjoy it. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Janice Namora, and we're talking about her recent book, uh, The Doctors Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. Uh, great subtitle, of course, talking about Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, um, two women doctors, um, notable uh, for the 19th century, certainly. Uh, and it's uh, going to be a really interesting conversation. They uh, intersect with Civil War medicine, of course, uh, which is why we're talking about it. But their accomplishments and achievements go well beyond Civil War medicine, um, which makes this uh, an especially exciting and interesting program. I know I'm looking forward to it, and I certainly hope you all enjoy it as well. Uh, so if you have any questions at all during the program, uh, go ahead and, and put them in the, in the comments section uh, and we'll get to all your questions or as many as we can uh, during the program. I see we've already got Jan tuning in from Orlando, Florida. It's always fun to hear where you all are watching us from. So that's wonderful. Uh, if you have enjoyed our videos that we've done throughout the, uh, the pandemic here, uh, consider go ahead and uh, liking this video, sharing this video across all social media platforms. That helps us out a lot, lets other people uh, see the program uh, either while we're live or after the fact. Um, so that helps us out a ton. That's totally free. Anyone can do it. Uh, it helps out the museum a ton. Uh, and if you want to take that extra step to supporting the museum, consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, we have memberships for as low as $25 a year that gets you free admission for a year. Now that, you know, we're starting to actually be able to go out and do things again, which is all very exciting. Um, the museum is open uh, Friday through Sunday for walk-ins uh, or uh, if you want to come during the week when there's less people, you can make an appointment uh, and you can come and uh, basically have the museum to yourself and take advantage of that membership um, that you get for uh, supporting the museum and videos like this. And we'll have a link to membership in the comments if that's uh, a way that you want to support us. Um, we'd certainly appreciate it. Um, so with all that said, uh, I want to go ahead and, and get into the our conversation here and the, the presentation. And I wanted to start off by asking um, kind of a, a twofold question. Um, Janice, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came to be interested in this particular topic, studying the, um, the, the doctors Blackwell. And, and you, know, you can kind of roll that in. I know you have sort of a, a presentation for us as well. And the other thing, you know, as I'm reading, I think it's such a brilliant subtitle. I was curious uh, just how you came to the subtitle, um, you know, how two pioneering sisters brought medicine to women and women to medicine. I love, I love just kind of how it rolls off the tongue. So if, if you could tackle all that and then you know, jump right into your presentation, that'd be great. Certainly, I think I'll thank you, first of all, John, for having me and for the to the museum for having me. I'm, I so wish we could have done this in person because it's just the kind of thing I like to go and, and study. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have so many things just all, the, all right there around you that I'd love to see. Um, I'll take your second question first. I can take no credit at all for that subtitle. Um, it was, uh, I think it was my, my literary agent who came up with that one. Um, it was a stroke of genius and we never looked back. Um, and for your first question about how I got into this, I think I'm gonna jump into my slides because it's just, I, I, I need visuals to talk about this a little Great. bit. So I'm gonna share my screen. Alrighty. So um, if you're familiar with the name Blackwell at all, it is usually Elizabeth Blackwell that you've heard of. And it's usually followed in your head by the phrase first woman doctor. She was the first woman in this country to receive a medical degree in 1849. Her sister, Emily, there on the right, um, followed her five years later to be the third to receive a medical degree. And together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time six years ago. Um, and I was shocked 
that I had never heard of them. Um, I grew up and still live in the city where they practice, New York. That's where I am right now. Um, I had attended a proudly feminist all girls school from the age of five. I was the math science kid at that school. I graduated with the intention of pursuing medicine, although that didn't last. Um, how had I never heard of them? It seemed impossible to me. Um, so I went, I went looking for them when, the, when, I, when, when once I had come across this name. And what I discovered was that the Blackwell story is not hard to find on the children's biography shelf. Um, if you go to the children's section, there are a lot of versions of the Blackwell story, or at least the Elizabeth Blackwell story. Um, this is a, a chapter book from the 1940s. Many of these books have very similar illustrations. They all feature a young, attractive, slim, well-dressed woman wearing a stethoscope and bending solicitously over a grateful patient. So a chapter version from the 40s. This is a middle grade version, a modern middle grade version from my uh, daughter's school library once upon a time. Again, nice clothes, uh, elegant young woman, stethoscope, grateful patient. Um, here's the children's picture book version, a younger, perkier version of Elizabeth with cute red hair bows. But there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting for her to grow up. So there's a problem here. The Blackwell sisters looked like this. And in the 1840s and 50s, when they were as young as the women who were pictured in all those picture books, um, stethoscopes would have looked like this. Um, so very clear instantly that there was a lot missing from these children's books. They were sanitized, they were simplified, there was nothing wrong with them. Um, but as I followed the Blackwell sisters into the archives and started to listen to their voices in their letters and journals, it became very clear that they were not um, picture book princesses. They were very complicated women. Um, and I became really eager to know their whole story and to reintroduce them to the present um, with all of their ragged edges intact. So what is that story, briefly? The, um, the Blackwells, eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England. They came to this country as children in 1832. Um, they were the sons and daughters of a man who was something of a paradox. He had made his money in the sugar refining industry. And in his free time, he was an ardent abolitionist. There is a contradiction there. Um, he uh, gave his five daughters the same education as his four sons. And on the strength of a dream, he moved them from Bristol all the way via New York to the edge of the known world, which in 1838, when they arrived there, was Cincinnati. Um, his dream was to find a way of making sugar out of sugar beets, which could be grown in the North without enslaved labor. Um, he got them all the way out to Cincinnati. Now his wife and nine children, ranging in age at this point from six to about 22. And then before they had even finished unpacking, he died, leaving them with about $20 and a clear lesson to his daughters that having a husband is no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. Um, they became at this point kind of a tribe, these nine siblings. Um, they turned in toward each other um, in their sort of precarious state. Uh, and they became a great gift to their future biographer because they were very important to each other, um, thought more highly of each other than almost anyone else in the world. And yet they all kind of drove each other nuts. So they were always leaving and writing to each other, which created an enormous wealth of information for me. Um, many, many years later. Um, if you're into Victorian letters, you know that um, in the early Victorian period, they often used something called cross writing um, because paper and postage were expensive. You would fill the sheet, turn it 90 degrees, fill it again. Sometimes you would flip it over and do the same thing on the back. This is a letter from Henry Blackwell, Elizabeth's younger brother to Elizabeth in 1844. Um, if you're me, and I, I, get, I, I get that this is a refine, this is a, 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 a sort of an acquired taste. I love this stuff. Henry had beautiful handwriting, so this actually wasn't that hard to read, but there was a lot of this. Um, you have to like decoding to do this kind of work. Um, Elizabeth was born in 1821. She just had her 200th birthday in, on February 3rd. She was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, and blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth. She admired the transcendentalist writer and editor Margaret Fuller, who at this point in the mid-1840s, when Elizabeth was coming of age, 
had written a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century, in which she argued that humanity was not going to achieve a new level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own power and proved that they could do anything they chose to. It was not a matter of sex. It was a matter of talent and effort. Women could be sea captains, said Margaret Fuller. And Elizabeth, reading this, began to think of her own life as one that might prove Margaret Fuller's point. She, as I said, had a healthy ego and thought big. Um, she wanted to be someone whose life could be a beacon and who, whose life could help humanity reach a, a higher plane. And so she chose medicine and it was a very strange choice for her. She chose it not because she lo loved science or because she loved healing people. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. She thought sickness was a form of weakness. Um, she chose medicine because for, for a very strategic purpose. Medicine was redefining itself, both scientifically and institutionally. Uh, to this point, it had been more of a trade, the trade of midwives or barber surgeons. Um, now, increasingly, it was a profession, a profession of men um, who were credentialed by virtue of having earned a medical degree. So Elizabeth Blackwell thought to herself, if I can find my way into a medical school and attend all the lectures, and pass the examinations. Who can argue that I am not as qualified as any man to be a doctor? Um, you know, thereby proving her point. And as this cartoon from the 1820s suggests, medical school in the 1840s still um, was not the overwhelming challenge that it is today. Medical med medicine was sort of what you pursued, pursued if you weren't bright enough for the law. Medical school consisted of two identical 16 week terms of lectures that you repeated one year after the next and you repeated them, they were the same. Um, mostly just listening and taking notes. If you were very lucky, there might be something to dissect. Um, but after two years, you had a medical degree without maybe any experience uh, in with living patients. Uh, Elizabeth knew that if she could find her way into a medical school, she would have very little trouble finding her way through. Uh, she was operating at a very high level of intellectual horsepower. So at the age of 26, she won admission to a tiny rural medical school in Geneva, New York, uh, at the top of Seneca Lake in the, in the Finger Lakes region. Um, first, she endured a sheaf of rejections, uh, not to mention ridicule, because the very idea of a woman who wanted a medical degree was outrageous. Um, it was outrageous because wanting to be a doctor was very far beyond the definitions of a woman's sphere. Um, and also then there was the practical consideration of um, getting a medical degree required sitting in a lecture hall and studying the intimate processes of the body in mixed company. What kind of a woman, woman would want to do that? So she either um, received gales of laughter or, or just horrified silence. Finally, uh, her letter of, of application reached Little Geneva Medical College, along with a letter of recommendation from a prominent Philadelphia physician who had allowed her to kind of um, observe his practice and learn a little bit where she could. Um, the story of her admission, if you read her memoir, which was written 50 years later, sounds like a triumphant foregone conclusion. You know, finally, a letter arrived. I was gratified. I bought a train ticket and off I went. Um, the true story, which is actually included in an appendix to the memoir, interestingly, is a little different. Um, when her letters and the letter of recommendation reached Geneva, the faculty were not quite bold enough to just reject the recommendation of this Philadelphia physician out of hand. So they punted. Um, they really didn't want a woman to come, but they didn't know what, quite what to do. So they said to the students, remember a group of rather boisterous provincial types, um, you shall vote. And if any one of you doesn't want a woman to come study among us, she won't come. They thought they were safe. But the students, recognizing that their professors were cowards, and this was a really good opportunity to make some mischief, um, had a student meeting that night where they basically bludgeoned anybody who dissented and returned a unanimous triumphant yes to the faculty the next morning and forgot all about it. They thought it was probably a prank that some rival medical school was playing on them. Um, they thought it was a practical joke until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall. Uh, once admitted, she really quickly gained the respect of her classmates and professors because she was operating with a level of motivation and intellectual power that just blew them all away. Um, she, she, and she also started to warm to her subject because she realized that medicine was the intellectual challenge that she really um, wanted to have. 
Um, she graduated at the top of her class in 1849, and then she needed some practical training because, as I said, she didn't get any in medical school. Um, so she did what a lot of uh, American medical graduates did at this point in history. She went to Europe to get some polish in the practical medical education arena. Um, the major medical centers in Europe at this point were London, Edinburgh, and especially Paris, um, where the Paris School was um, humming along with a level of progressive practical medical education that was unrivaled if you were a man. Um, most of the medical education that was available for free, so um, subsidized by the state, was not available if you were a woman wearing a dress. And re Elizabeth refused to dress in drag, as some people suggested, because the whole point was to prove that a woman could do this. So she found her way here to La Maternité, um, a a public obstetric hospital in an old convent, which still stands in Paris. Um, she found her way here to a hospital that was, um, it was a teaching hospital for people from all over France, young women from all over France to come and live and learn to be midwives. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell already had a medical degree and she was considerably older than the young women who came here to train and much more sophisticated, but she committed to being a student here for the benefit of the, um, practical experience that she could have. If you were a, now if you were a woman delivering in a hospital in 1849, you were destitute because if you had any money at all, you would deliver at home. This was a, a hospital for women with nowhere else to go. Uh, and it was an immediate education for Elizabeth in ideas about public health, connections between poverty and disease, between venereal disease and the plight of women. Um, it was also here that she endured a crisis that changed the shape of her career. Um, she was uh, treating an infant that had been born to a gonorrheal mother. Um, and if, when an infant passes through the birth canal of a, of a woman infected with gonorrhea, the infant can contract an eye infection called gonorrheal conjunctivitis. Uh, Elizabeth was tending to one of these infants, um, cleaning its eyes, when some of the washing liquid splashed into her own face, and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, and um, was, which today would be, while not a joke, it would be easily treated with antibiotics. In 1849, they hadn't been discovered yet. Um, she immediately was confined to a bed in the very hospital where she had been working, um, and lay there in agony for several weeks, not knowing whether she was going to be able to hold on to her sight. Um, this is a good moment to pause and, and, and reflect on what the biographer's job is here in telling the story. Um, she became the patient of her colleague, doc, the wonderfully named Dr. Hippolyte Blo, um, who had you know, been teaching her and now was treating her. Uh, this is how she described the, the, the crisis in her memoir, remember, 50 years later. Ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. Um, it sort of sounds like a romance novel. And in fact, as you can see from this photo, Dr. Blow fulfills the role of romantic hero. Um, at the same time, and happily for Elizabeth, her eldest sister, Anna Blackwell, happened to be in Paris and hearing of, of, her, of her sister's illness, rushed to the bedside. Um, Anna, as this photograph wonderfully suggests, um, was something of a drama queen. She was also a journalist by profession. And so she spent her days tending to her poor ill sister and her evenings writing copious letters back to the Blackwell clan in Cincinnati, uh, describing the state of Elizabeth's eye. This, here's how she describes it. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of this poor eye. So you get a sense of the different truths that you have to braid together to write a story like this. Um, Elizabeth eventually lost one eye and was fitted for a glass prosthetic. If you squint hard at this portrait, you can see that there is an asymmetry in her gaze, but it was subtle and many people throughout the rest of her life were not aware of her disability. Um, 
It did, however, change her focus in medicine. Surgery was no longer an option. And for someone who liked to think about ideas more than science, um, the, uh, the, the, lure, the allure of public health became stronger. And she became someone more and more who thought about and wrote about and spoke about medicine and public health rather than practiced it. Um, did she go home to convalesce? No, she went on to London to continue her training at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and made a fateful acquaintance. Mutual friends introduced her to Florence Nightingale, who at this point in 1851 was not yet the global celebrity, the lady with the lamp, the heroine of the Crimean War. Um, she was a young woman about a year older than Elizabeth um, of, from a wealthy family whose family really desperately wanted her to settle down and get married and she desperately didn't want to do that. Um, she had big ideas about a career in public health herself. And I like to imagine that her encounter with Elizabeth Blackwell was something of a catalyst for her own career. Here was this young woman from America who had turned her back on her family and any question of getting married and settling down. She had achieved a medical degree and she was roaming all over Europe getting practical experience in, med in medicine. She was proof that the things that Florence Nightingale daydreamed about were possible. And they had an immediate and rapturous friendship. Um, they spent a lot of time together. They had long discussions about hygiene and sort of rather radical ideas. Um, they continued to con communicate throughout their lives, although they soon stumbled upon the basic difference in their, in their worldviews, which was that Florence Nightingale believed the role of women in this field was as nurses. And Elizabeth Blackwell had dedicated her life to proving that women could be doctors. And on this, they never saw eye to eye. Um, so having completed her training in London, um, Elizabeth chose to open her practice in New York, where she thought she would be instantly successful because of course, women would want to seek the attention of a female doctor to confide the, the embarrassing details of their gynecological illnesses. And no one showed up. She, she, had, she struggled and struggled and patients just did not arrive. Why not? Well, partly because in 1851-52 in a place like New York, the very phrase female physician did not mean bright young woman with a medical degree. It meant someone like Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, um, caricatured here in the National Police Gazette as a baby eating demon. Um, a female physician was someone who worked on the wrong side of the law, um, who worked in the shadows, who, who, who respectable middle-class matrons did not consult unless something was very wrong. Um, so no one showed up and Elizabeth found herself becalmed. Meanwhile, she had recruited her sister, Emily, to follow her into medicine. Um, she knew that it was gonna be an arduous and difficult and lonely path and she wanted some company. She esteemed her own family higher than anybody else in the, in the world. So she picked her next youngest and most brilliant sister, Emily, to follow her. Emily had even more trouble getting a medical degree because in the wake of Elizabeth, um, the men's medical colleges uh, surely did not want another woman to, to prove to them that, that medicine was possible for women. Uh, to make matters even more complicated, in the intervening years, women's medical colleges had begun to open, um, which made it even easier for the men's medical colleges to say no to women. There was another place for them to go. Emily wanted a degree as challenging and rigorous as the one her sister had earned. So she finally achieved that uh, at Cleveland Medical College, which has since evolved into Case Western. Um, from the start, um, or so, so sorry, so uh, after achieving her degree in 1854, she too went to Europe. She went to Edinburgh and attached herself to the practice of James Young Simpson, who was then one of the most prominent physicians in Britain. Uh, he was a, a, a chair of obstetrics at the University of Edinburgh. He was the man who had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. He was a bit of a showman. Uh, I think he sort of enjoyed the shock value of having a woman among his assistants, but he taught her a great deal at the leading edge of obstetrics and gynecology, um, including the use of instruments like these, um, a pessary, who, which would have been used, uh, introduced into the cervix in cases of uterine prolapse um, down below an instrument he invented, Simpson's uterine sound, which was a graduated probe for measuring the cervix. Um, Emily taking all this in avidly because she was much more of a natural scientist than her sister, um, was then writing it in letters back to Elizabeth. You can see both of those instruments sketched in the margin of this letter uh, on the left. Uh, Elizabeth 
you know, sort of becalmed in New York. And now Emily, it's Emily who is who's really learning uh, and making progress and sending that progress back to her older sister. Uh, from the start, I wanted this to be a story of both sisters, not just Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor. Um, it's a little bit tricky because the material on Emily is thinner than the material on Elizabeth. She wasn't first, and so less was written about her. Um, she wrote less herself. What do you do when you have different amounts of material on your subjects? Well, one thing you can do is follow them around. So I went to Edinburgh to, um, to see what Emily had seen during her time there and really followed in her footsteps. It was a wonderful trip. This is 52 Queen Street uh, in the middle there with the extra story. James Young Simpson's residence where Emily would have gone every day. Um, in the spirit of following in the footsteps, the day I uh, went by to take this photo, the door was open, so I walked in. Um, it's, it's now a drug treatment center, so I wasn't exactly trespassing uh, on private property at least. Um, but I wandered around a little bit and managed to, you know, get a sense of where this woman was going every day um, in this unprecedented role as a, as a female physician in Edinburgh. Edinburgh had never seen such a thing. Um, things like, you know, the staircase with James Young Simpson's Latinized initials worked into the banister where she would have walked every day. Um, uh, that I got to glimpse a few details like that before they asked me to follow my footsteps out again. Um, I also went to the uh, Royal College of Surgeons Museum in Edinburgh, which is a wonderful, another wonderful medical museum to visit. If you're a fan of the Civil War Medical Museum, then you should definitely make a trip here. They didn't let me take pictures, but I have a, had a sketchbook. Um, lots of Simpson artifacts, like on the left, his pocket pill case that would have been used on house calls that said, please return to 52 Queen Street under the lid and contained horrifying medications like mercury and opium. Um, down below his monaural stethoscopes in ivory and rosewood, I wanted to believe that Emily herself might have used those uh, in, in performing examinations of his patients. And they even had the, um, the, the decanter he had used when he discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform. It's a wonderful place. Um, so Emily is really learning to become a doctor in Edinburgh, um, becoming quite a good one, in fact. Uh, of course, this is not enough to protect her from the same kind of snark that uh, Elizabeth had been victim to when she started out in medicine as well. This is a, a uh, cartoon from the London satiric newspaper Punch from the end of Emily's time in Edinburgh. It's meant to show Emily in the scandalous bloomer costume of the women's rights movement. Of course, Emily herself did not align with the women's rights movement, really, but, um, but that's another story. Um, Emily in a ridiculous hat with a rather mannish profile, squinting diagnostically at uh, the only patient who would consult a female physician, a lapdog, um, being clutched in the arms of a much more conventionally feminine young woman. Happily, both Emily and Elizabeth were good at ignoring this kind of silliness. They reconverged in New York and together in 1857 founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in a building that still stands in Greenwich Village on the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets, on the left as it was and on the right as it is now. Um, they, this was the first hospital staffed by women. Its intention not just to provide uh, the attentions of a female physician to the women of the neighborhood, but also to provide a place for the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates to come and train without having to go to Europe. Um, as you might imagine, having founded a hospital in 1857, the Blackwells were active in the Civil War. Um, when the first shots were fired in 1861, they called a meeting uh, of their donors and supporters in their own living room and drafted this appeal that ran in the New York Times on April 28th to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. Um, there was a lot of chaotic uh, excitement and energy being aimed uh, sort of inefficiently at the union cause. Um, they invited women who wanted to help to come to a meeting. And in response to this appeal, thousands of women came to a meeting in the Great Hall of Cooper Union, another building that's still here in New York, um, to form something called the Women's Central Association of Relief. Um, 
eventually out of this organization came, grew the, the US Sanitary Commission. So you can sort of draw a straight line from Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell's living room to the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. Um, the Blackwell sisters, as you might imagine, were put in charge of the committee that would be selecting and training young women to serve as nurses at the front. And they threw themselves into this work. At, at first, it really felt like the, uh, the fruition of this idea that Margaret Fuller had first had uh, of, of men and wo women working shoulder to shoulder in the service of a great cause. And, um, and they spent a, a year of, of real industrious work um, helping to find uh, women to be nurses and train them. Um, but there was a growing sense of dismay because what became clear was that male physicians in New York were not necessarily interested in working shoulder to shoulder with female physicians. It was one thing to work with people like Florence Nightingale or with uh, Dorothea Dix in Washington who became the leader there. These were women without medical training. Um, it was easier to think of them in a slightly different space, but the Blackwells provided something of a threat um, and they didn't take kindly to the kind of rejection they started to feel. Elizabeth Blackwell referred to Dorothea Dix as the meddler in chief. And after a year of, of hard work, they, they withdrew their support from the war effort um, in, in, in frustration and turned their attention to their newest venture together, which was the foundation of their own women's medical college, something of an irony. They had always disdained the women's medical colleges, but the graduates who were coming to them to finish their training, the graduates of the existing female medical colleges, they didn't impress the Blackwells very much. So the Blackwells finally said, well, if men are not going to admit women, we need to found our own college for the time being that is at least if not more rigorous than the men's institutions until that time when men and women are able to study medicine together. So that's what they did in 1869. So that's the arc of their professional lives. Um, personally, they were just as interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily lived with her female partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier, for the last several decades of her life. Um, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent feminists of the moment, Lucy Stone, the suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to be ordained as a minister. Uh, to complicate the story further, Elizabeth and Emily did not feel a great degree of sisterhood with these sisters-in-law. Um, they did not align with the women's movement, did not necessarily think of suffrage as the, the top priority for women. Um, it was a it was a, a complicated story. Uh, to complicate it further, they didn't always agree with each other about the role of women in medicine. Uh, Elizabeth, as I mentioned, came to think of the role of a female doctor as a teacher armed with science. She really focused more on public health and moral reform. Emily was more of a scientist. She thought the role of a woman in medicine was to be as excellent a practitioner and surgeon and medical professor as the men. And that's what she was. Um, in 1870, and with some relief, the sisters parted ways and spent the last 40 years of their lives on different continents. Elizabeth went back to London, to England, um, where she had always wanted to return and pursued public health for the last uh, phase of her life. Emily remained in New York and ran the institutions that they had founded very successfully, almost to the detriment of her own legacy. Um, she, because now, uh, today, we remember Elizabeth Blackwell and not necessarily Emily's name. Um, so that's the, that's the outline of the story. And this moment, as we both spend an inordinate amount of time talking about public health and we celebrate new uh, female leadership at unprecedented levels, it feels like a good time for this story. Um, the Blackwells were not perky or pretty. They were not interested in pleasing anyone. They were complicated and prickly and imperfect and very real heroines, and they changed the world. Thanks for listening, and um, maybe we should have a little conversation now. Yeah, well, I mean, what an incredible story. Um, I, I mean, I, I certainly uh, learned a lot listening to that. Uh, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. Fascinating uh, figures, certainly. Uh, and I think you're right, well suited to, you know, certainly the moment that we're in now. And, you know, well suited for their own time as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so a few kind of general comments that, you know, your presentation kind of made me think is that, you know, despite the 
you know, the, the extensive roadblocks, trials and challenges that the sisters, you know, encountered in, you know, acquiring their medical education, their path actually really, really closely resembles that of, you know, the vast majority of Civil War surgeons um, during the war in that, you know, they get their medical degree. Um, they don't have a lot of practical experience. Uh, they, many go to Europe um, to, to kind of, as sort of a finishing school almost, and then they come back and get involved in the Civil War. Um, of course, you know, the male Civil War surgeons, of course, end up serving on the front lines, which I don't think is quite something that uh, Elizabeth or Emily wound up doing. But, but that trajectory um, certainly struck a lot of familiar chords um, for, you know, uh, any of our viewers who might be familiar uh, with Civil War medicine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot, lot of interesting things in there. Well, let me check the comments here. I know we've got a, a number of people uh, tuning in. We got uh, Barbara from New Jersey, John from Lakeland, Florida, two of our very faithful viewers. Uh, Karen tuning in from Stafford, Virginia, and, and uh, she says she's almost finished with the book and that she's really enjoying it. So there we go, at least uh, one positive review. Uh, Kyle from Maryland, Carolyn from Gettysburg, uh, another friend of the museum. Um, let's see, Jan asks, uh, did the Doctors Blackwell uh, esteem female nurses in the sense that the surgeons and physicians in the Civil War did not? So did they, I mean, I know you mentioned that um, uh, Elizabeth and Florence Nightingale, butted heads might be a strong word, but they fundamentally disagreed about the, the role of women. Like, so during the war, uh, how did they feel about say someone like Dorothea Dix and other kind of volunteer nurses? Right. I mean, I think from the start, there was a class issue in play for the Blackwells. Um, to them, from the very beginning, long before the Civil War, um, a nurse was a, a, a working class person. Uh, and what they were doing was at least a middle class thing. Um, they, were, they, they thought of themselves as part of the intelligentsia and studying medicine and getting a medical degree kept them there. Um, nursing was something beneath their station in their minds. Uh, that wasn't to say they didn't esteem nurses, they esteemed good nurses, um, but they just started with that, that baseline. Um, the women they were training and selecting um, for the Civil War, you know, had, there, there was a, a list of, of of qualifications. They had to be above 30. They had to be, you know, have sober recommendations. They had to be sober in their dress. <laughs> um, there was a, there was sort of a, a set of, of, um, of bars that, that women had to pass before they would be considered, um, you know, uh, sort of plain spoken, sober, serious minded enough to, to, in, to take this on. They didn't want any frivolous women who just really liked soldiers. Um, to be to be signing up for this, um, but yeah, there there was always you know, and this is a theme throughout um, the Blackwell story, a theme of female misogyny, um, a sense that uh, most women didn't uh, rise to to the Blackwell level of excellence, um, and it's something it's a complicating factor in their story, and something that I find makes them more interesting because I think it, it, I find it so modern and familiar that 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 women accomplished women accomplished people um, are can often be remarkably uncharitable to people who are less accomplished than they um, an unfortunate truth yeah that I mean it's when you think about it for more than you know a minute or two it kind of makes sense I mean you could sort of could sort of see that happening. I mean, I, I also think it, you know, certainly makes the story more interesting. You know, we we want to, and I think kind of the impulse of some of those those earlier works that you mentioned in your uh, in your presentation, you know, about you know Elizabeth Blackwell being the first female doctor, especially the the one for kids with the the, the very historically accurate pigtails, <laughs> the young girl. I mean, I think the impulse in there is that you know these women should be celebrated because they did all kinds of really awesome things and they kind of broke a lot of barriers for women at the time. But in in the process of celebrating them, we we think, well, they never did anything wrong ever. You know, they were these kind of perfect modern uh, people. Uh, and, you know, there's a, you know, a sliver of truth to that, but it, like in all things in life, it's just so much more complicated than that. That's right. That's right. And I, um, I think it, 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 the, it just and, sounds... and to kind of play, well, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say it's, it's a, it's an important challenge to recognize 
the things that your heroes do that aren't always admirable. Um, you know, that, that, that heroism can come with flaws. Uh, and then if you can look squarely at them alongside the heroism, you get a much more dimensional picture of a human. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of playing off that, this whole idea about, you know, the complex nature, I think it's fascinating that uh, you mentioned this specifically about Emily and I think Elizabeth probably um, what was this way as well, but that they weren't necessarily advocates for, you know, the, the women's rights movement. And it was interesting, I had a conversation with Dr. Tom Brown, um, which I'd encourage everyone to go back and watch. We talked about Dorothea Dix. Uh, he uh, wrote a biography of her. Um, and Dorothea Dix wasn't necessarily a huge advocate of the, the women's rights movement either. And I think it's so fascinating that these people we you know, in the 21st century, you tend to think about, you know, these liberating forces, you know, for, you know, the women's empowerment and, and things of this nature, maybe didn't, didn't uh, support that as much as we might think they did. You want to maybe say a little bit more about that and that kind of curious relationship there? Right. I mean, it was never a monolithic movement. Um, the, the, the women's rights movement that we think of when we think of Seneca Falls and the Declaration of Sentiments and women's rights conventions, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the, that, that crowd, um, they were very interested in Elizabeth Blackwell. And, and, and from the start, I mean, it was interesting, Geneva College, the, the successor institution is Hobart and William Smith Colleges. It's right there, right next to Seneca Falls. Um, you know, she was she was right nearby when the Declaration of Sentiments was was being drafted, uh, and they reached out to her and they said, "Come, join us. Your 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 um, your accomplishment is extraordinary, and we would like to celebrate you and 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 you know get some of your glory to to help our cause." And she definitively rejected them um, for a couple of reasons. One was that the the first priority of the women's movement. Um, or at least the Seneca Falls movement was the vote. And, you know, there was a difference of opinion there about whether that was the right place to start for women. Elizabeth Blackwell really firmly believed that if you gave women the vote before you gave them a sense of their own right to have independent opinions, that they would just vote the way their men told them to vote. And that didn't help anybody, um, which is one way of looking at it. Um, the other piece of it is that I think like many trailblazing women, Elizabeth was not particularly drawn to collaboration. She didn't really want to join a team. She wanted to be an idealist alone. Um, she wanted to, you know, shine as a beacon. And, you know, you don't do that in a crowd. And so when people reached out to her to say, join us, she instinctively turned away um, because she always wanted to be, you know, doing the thing that no one had done yet um, and, not, and not be part of a team. Again, you know, I, the same, it, 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 the same thing is true. You know, history is just the same thing that's happening now, just back then. No cause is ever monolithic. There's never every, any one singular way to address an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's certainly an important lesson of the Blackwell story, um, that, that no cause is monolithic. And, and, you know, I find it interesting that, you know, throughout all of these programs that we've done, a lot of the stories that we tell serve to underscore what on the surface are pretty simple lessons, but they're lessons that we often need reminding of <laughs> on a regular basis. So, um, so I, I love that this draws us to that. And you're, it's interesting you mentioned um, that, you know, the Elizabeth Blackwell didn't necessarily like collaboration. Uh, Clara Barton, who we talk a lot about here at the museum, mm -hmm. also pretty famously didn't like to be a part of a team either. Um, so yeah, it's interesting drawing some of these parallels here. Right. Right. Well, and, and kind of to that point, um, uh, you, you, you go ahead first. No, no, I was just going to say it, it, it's an interesting thing that sometimes pushing people away and keeping yourself singular results in a, in a legacy that, that persists. Whereas somebody like Emily Blackwell, who actually was a better collaborator, did, you know, what, did work as part of a team to run the institutions that they had founded in New York, ends up the forgotten one, even though in her lifetime, she was more, um, more loved, I think, uh, and more, more respected as a, as a, as a mentor than Elizabeth, who remained sort of a, a remote ideal, an idea rather than a person. Hmm. Fascinating, e even in her own times, mm -hmm. um, in some ways, you know, standing as an idea more than a person. And this question that we got, I think is kind of interesting in light of this 
discussion we've just been having here uh, from the comments. Uh, have you seen mention of early black medical graduates in the Blackwell's papers? Uh, David Jones Peck, MD, was the first black medical school graduate uh, from Rush Medical College in 1847. Um, it would be interesting to imagine what these pioneer individuals might have thought of each other. Definitely. Um, one of so once the in, once the infirmary was founded in 1857, uh, as I mentioned, uh, young female graduates, medical graduates, would come to get some practical training and become what the Blackwells called sanitary visitors, people who fanned out into the tenement neighborhoods and brought hygiene and, and prenatal care to women in their homes. And one of the women who served in that post was a woman named Rebecca Cole, who was one of the first black female graduates of the Philadelphia Medi Women's Medical College. Um, I think she graduated in 1867. Um, and came to the infirmary as as one of the as one of the the, the interns. Um, and it's interesting, you know, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell had a deep and long history as abolitionists. They had been, you know, raised at their father's knee with those ideas, had participated in some of the earliest uh, abolitionist conventions in New York that included women um, when they were still living there before they moved to Cincinnati. And I, I found it interesting to note um, that when Rebecca Cole joined them, there was no uh, special, you know, uh, note. There, there, there was there was nothing in the in their archival record to express surprise or consternation. It was very matter of fact. She was excellent. She had written a wonderful thesis on ophthalmology, and of course, we wanted to have her here. Um, I thought that very nonchalance was very indicative of their attitude toward you know their own conviction that it wasn't about external things like sex or race. It was about talent and effort. And if you could demonstrate those things, then great, come work. Um, that was it. I, I wish there had been more material on Rebecca Cole because she seemed like a wonderful character. But again, I'm not a novelist, so I couldn't create more for her. <laughs> um, we uh, got another great question um, that is going to be very easy to answer. Uh, Sue Ann asked, uh, I missed the beginning of the talk. Does Janice Namora have a book about the Blackwells? Good news. <laughs> yes. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so just in case you missed the beginning, uh, she's the author of The Doctors Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. Uh, and if you happen to miss the beginning, once the stream is over, you can go back and watch the whole thing start to finish on demand as many times as you want. Um, so uh, good news for that. And if you like the sort of programs we do, best way to keep in touch with us is to subscribe to us on YouTube and like us across all the social medias. So yes, she does have a book, <laughs> uh, which is very good, uh, I would add. Uh, and I'm sure you picked up on that from uh, from our conversation here. Um, let's see, uh, Jan asked another question. Uh, did either Blackwell make a lasting impact on the notion of wellness stemming from good hygiene? Were either of them able to affect any changes at local levels for making environments more hygienic? Yeah, I mean, they. It, it's interesting to watch them. You know, they came to medicine at a moment where simple ideas about hygiene had not yet taken hold. You know, people were still dying of childbed fever because the doctors were going from the autopsy straight to the delivery without washing their hands. Um, the Blackwells instinctively understood that cold water and fresh air were powerful forces for good and that calomel, mercury, and, and laudanum, which was opium-based, were not. Um, they had watched their own family members uh, not heal <laughs> under the care of doctors. And in fact, there are moments where Elizabeth says, you know, if, if I ever get sick, don't let me fall into the hands of any of those doctors. <laughs> Just like give me some cold water and fresh air and send me out for a walk and give me a bath and that'll be, that'll be fine, thanks. Um, they did definitely um, uh, sort of spread those ideas once they had their own institution. Um, it was interesting to watch this tension because they were trying to trying desperately. This was their whole mission was to achieve legitimacy in the eyes of a male medical establishment. It's hard to achieve legitimacy in the eyes of a traditional establishment if your ideas are revolutionary. So they couldn't be overt in their um, uh, in their instinctive embrace of things like hygiene at first um, because they needed the approval of the men. 
which made them very eager to found their own institution. They would, that Elizabeth wrote that she wanted to be able to commit heresy with intelligence. And it's much easier to do that if you have your own place to do it and you're not beholden to other people. So once they had their own place, that's what they did. And, and those sanitary visitors you know, went out into the surrounding neighborhoods and said, open your windows. Um, you know, make sure your water is clean. Uh, you know, here's some ideas about prenatal care. He's, here's some ideas about infant care. Um, they definitely made that difference. Um, and in fact, Rebecca Cole, I, I think, learned something about this from them because she went on to be um, an early proponent for the idea that race has nothing to do, that race should not have anything to do with health, that it's the state of your basement, she said, not the color of your skin that should, that should have a bearing on, on whether you thrive or not. So interesting ideas there. Indeed, I love the phrase commit heresy with intelligence. So that's just fantastic. <laughs> get, get that on a t-shirt, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. Um, yeah, well, so it, it's, it, it's a especially interesting question. You know, we of course talk all the time here at the museum that you know, there, there, there's no discovery of germ theory during the civil war, which you know, of course causes all kinds of issues. Um, and, and, you know, I, I almost wonder if perhaps that instinctual knowledge that you point to might have something to do with the fact that they're in many ways kind of coming to the medical system, you know, as m more of an outsider than their, their male counterparts. And that sort of, you know, fresh eyes almost kind of points them in that direction, maybe. Right, definitely. And, and, and not just as outsiders, but as, as insiders also, because women were at the bedside, um, mm -hmm. probably more consistently than the doctors were. You know, Elizabeth had watched her father die in Cincinnati and had been there when the doctor came and went and could see that what was being done, you know, the, the idea of heroic medicine was, you know, in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the before times when there was nothing really useful that, that the doctors had at, in their toolboxes, you needed to do something that made something happen. You needed to do something that, that seemed to get results. Otherwise your, your patients, your, your clientele would not want to pay you. Um, so she could see that what was, what was being administered to her father. And, and then later in England, there's a wonderful scene in the book. She, she passes through her cousin's home on their way to her studies in Europe and her cousin becomes ill and they call the doctor. Of course, no one realizes that she is a doctor. Um, but they, so they call the local doctor who comes and starts to hurt her cousin with his remedies. Um, she takes the remedies away and substitutes, um, you know, like uh, colored water and bread pellets for the, for, the, for the medicines that he's being given. And he recovers and then he discovers the subterfuge and insists that the doctor's medicines be given to him, whereupon he sickens again. So it, I mean, it was, it's that graphic, that, that sort of, you know, what's, what, what these doctors are bringing with them is not helpful. Um, Elizabeth, you know, from, from growing up as a woman in a household had, a, had an intimate knowledge of that. Mm. Yeah. That's an incredible, incredible story that people are willing to be sexist to the point of, uh, you know, at, at the risk of their own health. Holy cow. Right. Um, and it happened again. It happened again um, when Emily was training in Edinburgh, when she's watching James Young Simpson, who does some really barbaric surgical um, techniques on, on, on the women who consult him with various troubles that she can see are not effective because she is one of the only people observing him who is living in a female body. And she can, she, she can see, um, she knows from her own lived biological experience that what he is doing is not, is not a good idea. Um, but nobody else who's watching him has that knowledge because they're all men. Um, and, and his patients just do what they're told and, and don't see a progression of other patients who are suffering in the same way. So again, you know, a perspective that is, is brand new Wow. <laughs> Another incredible story. I mean, it's uh, thankfully, you know, a bit harder to imagine things like that now, which is not to say things like that never happen um, now, but yeah, thankfully it's uh, a bit more challenging to kind of, you know, process things like that. Um, let me see here. Uh, Barbara asks, uh, what were their attitudes on birth control slash contraception? Um, again, not in line with what we want our feminist heroes to say. Um, Elizabeth was more vocal about this than Emily. Um, she thought abortion was an abomination. Um, she, you know, she wanted to become a doctor 
in order to reclaim the, the, the term female physician from people like Madame Rostel. Um, she was not in favor of um, artificial contraception. She thought that the way to, con she thought controlling family size was a good idea, an important idea for health. But the way she told women to go about that was to say, not tonight, dear. Um, and that was for a woman who, who never confronted these issues personally, she, she remained single and childless. Um, uh, these were wildly impractical pieces of advice for most women. Uh, they just weren't useful. Um, so, uh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, you know, I, so she had these ideas that were very much of, of the moment at which she had come to medicine. They were moral ideas um, anchored in, um, in a, a, a level of her, her lived experience was, was always on the ideal plane. It never had much to do with the, you know, the, the actual anguish of a woman facing an unwanted pregnancy or, or facing a seventh pregnancy in, in, an, in an unwell state. Um, those weren't things that she really had ever bumped up against. Mm -hmm. And uh, a further, you know, a useful way to underscore that you know, even though we want it to a lot is that medicine doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, there are so many other kind of layers to, to all of this. Uh, and, you know, today you, you don't have to look any further than, you know, the, the current pandemic. You know, there, especially, you know, with political health, there's so many, uh, or sorry, public health, there's so many political dimensions to it, you know, that we've all lived through over, um, you know, the last year and, and some change. and the you know the exact issues and things were different but there are so many other layers to, to these things so the whole idea of contraception birth control there's kind of political public relations societal norms all kind of wrapped up in it that you know it's the these decisions and positions that doctors male and female are taking on this are not being made in a vacuum mm -hmm. um, and i think that's so easy to forget um, that there's a, a lived context in which these people are making these decisions decisions and forming their opinions. Yep, I think that's exactly right. I also think that Emily Blackwell was in much closer touch with the lived reality of her patients than Elizabeth was. Um, I think, you know, what Elizabeth was was prescribing uh, wasn't realistic for a lot of women. And, and I think Emily, you know, in her writing definitely spoke of, of wanting to try and find solutions to the problems that women faced, um, the anguish of, of, of maternity in a lot of cases. Um, in a much more practical way. Well, this has just been an absolute delight. I see we're, we've uh, reached the end of the, the questions uh, from the, the comment section here. Uh, I know I had a great time. Uh, I hope everyone out there watching did as well. And, and, and I hope you did too, Janice. Um, excellent. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have you uh, someday here in person uh, at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, thank you to everyone out there who uh, joined us today. Um, stay tuned. Uh, we continue to do uh, broadcasts, put out videos at least once a week on our YouTube channel. Uh, so the best way to stay in touch with us is to hit the subscribe button. That way you get notified anytime we go live or post a video so you can uh, keep up with us. Uh, like this video, share this video, all of that stuff helps us subscribe, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter uh, and Instagram and wherever you get your social media. All of that uh, helps us out immensely and it's all free to do. Uh, if you wanna take the extra step and support us in these videos, uh, consider becoming a member uh, of the museum for as low as $25 a year, you can go higher. I won't stop you. Um, you can uh, sign up and become a member and get you free admission, access to our newsletter and journal, uh, which we put out uh, four times a year, uh, and discounts in our gift shop and, and all kinds of other things. Um, so there's a link for that in the comment section uh, or the description of the video. Uh, and I see a number of people chiming in, uh, giving their thanks. Uh, Jan says, splendidly informative. And I would have to agree. Um, so having me. yes, th thank you so much for, for being here, Janice. This is wonderful. Uh, and so 
with all that said, uh, let's see, I think uh, we'll be back next Friday, I think it is. We're going to be with uh, a currently practicing medical doctor, uh, which will be wonderful. We're going to talk about the parallels between Civil War medicine and modern medicine, the ways they're similar, dissimilar, and everything in between. So you won't just have to take our word for it. We're just historians. We play doctors on TV. <laughs> um, we're going to have an actual doctor here. Um, so that should be a good time. That'll be next Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So till then, this is John and Janice signing off. Thank you so much.